Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, let's talk about One Piece chapter 952. If you have not read chapter 952 of One Piece, do not watch this video. I will be spoiling you. So for the most part, I felt like this was a fairly straightforward chapter without anything that I would I would call amazing, right? The end cliffhanger of this chapter is, you know, Gyukimaru, how what is his relationship with Kawamatsu? But I'm gonna be frank with you, I don't right now, I don't really care all that much. As far as I'm concerned, Gyukimaru might just well be considered a samurai. A samurai monk who in the past, just like many other characters in Wano and in the story, have some kind of connection to Odin, Curry, and his vassals. So the end cliffhanger wasn't really all that exciting for me because everybody should know about Kawamatsu. Kawamatsu is one of the famous red scabbards. I mean, all of Wano should know about him. And I would assume that everybody who is in Wano who does not like the Shogun or does not like Kaido or the Beast Pirates would be in favor of his return and would cry about that. It's like, okay, finally, the huge evil in this world, in this land is going to be scourged. Toki's prophecies are famous. And does Kawamatsu know Gukimaro? I would assume so. But Kawamatsu also knows a ton of other samurai. Now, ultimately, I think that I will enjoy this relationship. I think that Oda is going to go somewhere cool with it. But as of now, we just lack really that that piece that sort of fits them together in, a, in an interesting way. But, you know, I'm sitting here telling you that the cliffhanger to this chapter was kind of meh. And I think that that's the case from the surface level of the story. But I also think at the very beginning of the chapter, there may be a clue which hints at um, sort of my optimism for this and where this might end up going in the story that might hype the entire fandom. But yeah, before we get into it, I just want to say this again. If Gyukimaru is just some sort of samurai monk person who just has a previous relationship with Kawamatsu because he was in some way an ally to or loyal to the Kozukis who were, you know, the emperor, the shogun of all of Wano, I don't think that that is particularly interesting. But anyway, earlier in the chapter, Zoro is trying to retrieve Shusui from Gukimaru. He asks him, is your life worth this sword? And it gets them talking about the sword itself, and Gukimaru has this to say. Your Shusui is a stolen treasure of Wano. The day that sword left this land is the day misfortune arrived. That loss incited the anger of the sworn god. The anger of the sworn god. Defeat came to every village. Eventually, our whole country was overrun. So I'm just kind of projecting here because I haven't really read anybody else's interpretation of the chapter. I haven't read any discussion about it. But I assume that the vast majority of people who read this assumed that the sworn god would be, of course, Kaido, who is the current, basically, deity god of the country of Wano. So then the straightforward surface level interpretation of what Gukimaro is basically saying is that Moria came into the country for whatever reason, stole the sword, and that in, in his own, you know, religious, in his own sort of superstitious mind was the moment in which Wano became unprotected from Kaido's later takeover of the country. So the sword is stolen and incited the wrath of the sworn god Kaido and has led to uh, Wano's current demise. But yeah, this is what I assume that most people thought after reading the chapter. I could be wrong. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments if you thought something different. But my immediate impression is that Oda might just be playing us, leading us to believe that the Sworn God is 100% and always has been Kaido. Uh, but I think that, that that may not be the case. I think that Wano may have another Sworn God, one that we do not know about. So this could work in a couple ways, and we'll discuss it in a moment. What, what I wanted to point out to you guys is that Gyukimaru is a monk, some sort of religious guy. Like, he, he believes strongly in some sort of religion, one that most likely predates any of Kaido's interactions in Wano. I consider him to be a kind of, like, battle priest, following the teachings of something much more ancient than himself, and believes in a god that has been present in Wano from even before Kaido ever visited. So I said that this could work a couple ways, and this is how I would rationalize it. First off, there could be a completely different god than Kaido, and that is who he's referring to. The sworn god is not Kaido in any form or fashion. Gyukimaru does not think that, does not believe that. Oda is being very misleading with the way that he has worded it and the way that he has presented it. And because of all that has befallen Wano in the past 20 years, Gyukimaru assumes that the theft of Shusui has inspired this god's rage. 
Another hypothetical, another thing we don't know that we should probably consider is whether or not if this god is separate from Kaido, whether or not it is a real god, something that actually exists or once existed, or whether it's, uh, you know, like a superstitious god, like a Neptune or, or a Poseidon, sort of like the situation where a sailor goes out to sea and then a storm hits and they assume that this is like Poseidon's wrath, that's like not actually a god influencing it, it is weather. So in this case, it's not a real quote unquote god, not a god that we would actually tangibly meet. I find it much more interesting to consider the possibility that there is an actual god somewhere in Wano that at some point in time, time we might actually be introduced to, or somebody or something from the current story arc will relate to the god of the past. So maybe the god once existed but no longer exists. But on the other side of the coin here, Gyukimaru could think of Kaido as the sworn god, but not necessarily because Kaido is that sworn god, but because he resembles him. I, I would say that, you know, this could honestly go in a bunch of different directions, but just to share my thoughts here, guys, I'm very curious about the relationship between dragons and Wano historically. We know from the one-shot monsters, which uh, Oda wrote before One Piece, uh, and has tied into the actual history of the One Piece story, the monsters, which is came before One Piece is now technically the events took place in Wano and has a, its main character in that story was Ryuma, the, the, the dragon slayer from Thriller Bark. So a question I've asked myself is why is Kaido a god, a deity in the eyes of the people of One Piece? And I think that the reason is as straightforward as possible. He is a dragon and it may be possible that that the, the people of Wano historically have in some form or fashion uh, worshipped dragons. So yeah, Kaido is not their sworn god, but when he appeared 20 years ago to ravage the land, the people in Wano assume, okay, well, this is our god's vengeance. We've done some sort of wrong, and in Gukimaro's case, he, he thinks it's because that the sword Shusui was stolen. We could meet a dragon, another dragon, a real dragon, if Kaido is not a real dragon in Wano. We know at the very least, 400 years ago, they existed and they attacked. Wano, where are they now? But this is just kind of a general idea. I would say that my actual theory, which is obviously a filling in gaps that maybe we shouldn't be filling in at this point in time, but I personally wonder whether or not the, the people of Wano worship somebody who could control dragons. One thing that I find to be interesting is that the dragon in the past of Wano that Ryuma slayed was actually attacking Wano. And almost to sort of echo this, 20 years ago, the sword Shusui was stolen in Yukimaro's mind Again, a dragon attacks Wano. So maybe the religion of Wano that Gukimaru subscribes to is basically like, if you do wrong, then I, as the sworn god, will send a dragon to destroy you. So this is potentially how Gukimaru has interpreted the arrival of Kaido. So in Gukimaru's mind, Kaido could very well be the sworn god's calamity. And you know, just to throw something out there, maybe the reason why he doesn't want to return Shusui uh, to, to Zoro, even if it costs him his own life, as he believes that Shusui is the weapon that the people of Wano need in order to defeat Kaido, the, the weapon bestowed upon them by the Sworn God. The sword that which could kill dragons. Anyway, I don't want to dig too deep into a yet unrevealed possible mythology and religion, but I guess the reason why I'm speculating this, the, the reason why this clicks in my mind as, as something that could work is, you know, I've said this for a long time, uh, but I believe that there's a possibility that Momonosuke is the ancient weapon Uranus. Or at the very least, Momonosuke being from Wano has very curious powers which could relate to this. Momonosuke has the unique ability of being able to control and command Zunisha, something that, that his father and Luffy and Roger never could. I recommend everybody out there to reread the end of the Zo arc when Jack attacked. There was a conversation between Luffy, Momonosuke, and Zunisha, but Zunisha basically implies that at some time in the distant past, there was somebody with the very same unique abilities as Momonosuke. Somebody who gave Zunisha an order that over a thousand year time period, he could never break. In my mind, I consider Momonosuke and whoever had this ability in the past to essentially be the rightful, the true king of Zunisha. Issuing commands that Zunisha, even if it wanted to, could never break. During the events on Zo, Zunisha was attacked. It is very old, is very frail, it could have fallen. It didn't want everybody that it was housing to die along with it. It badly wanted to protect them, but it absolutely could not. Not unless Momonosuke ordered that it could defend itself. And so I think that it's pretty straightforward uh, how the theories of Momonosuke being Uranus arose based on this. If you consider him to be basically the true king of Sunisha, 
with some kind of unique inherited powers that skipped multiple generations. And also it seems incredibly likely that there is an ancient ancestor who also had these very same abilities and that these abilities skipped multiple generations, it should remind you of Poseidon. Powers considered to have the capability of destroying the world. So if Momonosuke can control more than Zunisha, if there's a kind of clan of creatures, these land kings, or if he can con control land creatures in general, then it should be just as powerful, just as fearsome. And just frankly, guys, I think that Momonosuke simply being able to control a single giant elephant just feels a bit contrived, feels a bit random. It would make more sense if his powers were more encompassing or based on particular rules or abilities that he might have. So then the powers of Uranus is like an alternate to the powers of Poseidon. But whether or not you want to call Momonosuke's abilities the abilities of Uranus or not, I know that is very controversial. People have many various reasons why they don't like it or they don't I believe it, Momonose definitely has some kind of unique ability and it could very well relate to what I'm talking about here with this theory about, about the Sworn God. Going back to what I said earlier, I theorize that it's possible that in Gyukimaro's mind, the Sword God was angered at the, the theft of Shusui and could possibly have set Kaido on Wano. Or at least that could be his religious interpretation. Set a giant, ferocious, monstrous, flying dragon on Wano. Possibly another kind of land king, a creature like Zunisha. But I think it's important here to bring up another character as well, although it's not very clear what the relationship is between Tama's abilities and Momonosuke's abilities, in many ways they are very similar, and Oda very well could have intended that. Otama has a devil fruit ability where she is able to produce Kibi Dango from her cheeks, and when fed to an animal or an animal-human hybrid allows her to become its master and control them fully. So let's just be straight up about this. It is entirely plausible. We don't know exactly how Devil Fruit abilities work and whether, I mean, probably the ability would die with the user given if it, it is a Devil Fruit. But if, if Tama fed a Kibi Dango to Zunisha, then theoretically she could control Zunisha in the very, very same way as we were discussing Momonosuke do. Issuing it commands that it cannot break, that it would refuse to break. Just as in this past chapter when Tama fed a Kibi Dango to one of the headliners who was previously its enemy, it eats this and it's all of a sudden 100% extremely loyal to the point that it's willing to lie to its former boss without repercussions for its own well-being. Or his own well-being. And you know, we laughed about this before and I absolutely refuse to believe that this is what is going to happen, although Oda did say that he didn't know how Kaido could be defeated or how he was going to allow the strats to defeat Kaido. But Tama could feed a Kibi Dangle theoretically to Kaido if he is an actual dragon or even has consumed just a dragon devil fruit. We don't know exactly the interactions between the Kibi Dango and actual devil fruits. Tama could control Kaido. But I do believe that Tama's abilities are the abilities of a devil fruit. It is not some sort of unique power to herself, like I think for Momonosuke. So I'm not exactly sure of the relationship between Momonosuke's ability and her own. All I'm saying is it seems to me uh, very purposeful on Oda's part to have sort of two ways of, of having, you know, what is essentially the same ability. Or at least could be the same ability if Momonosuke can control more than just one giant elephant for random reasons. And we talked about this before, but both Tama and Momonosuke are inspired by the folktale of Momotaru, or the peach boy who was hatched from a peach egg. Tama's name literally meaning egg. Momo and Momonosuke meaning peach. And in some of the same ways, in some different ways, they represent him and his actions from that story. And the crux of that story was Momotaru with a, a, a gang of, of, of animal allies going and taking down the Oni in his island called Onigashima. And it just makes me curious right now, guys, that you have the egg and the peach traveling together as though they may be two halves to some kind of whole. But anyway, guys, it certainly seems feasible to me that the culture of Wano may believe in some sort of deity, the sworn god, who has the ability to control animals, because there's at least two examples of people seemingly capable of that feat. And then through the eyes of the monk Gukimaru, it makes sense for the sworn god to have sent a calamity in the form of Kaido to, to seek retribution on, on Wano for the loss of the relic Shusui. Anyway guys, we have some other things that we want to talk about uh, from this chapter. This is sort of just my, my big theory, I guess, 
from the chapter, but I personally am very suspicious of this reveal of the Sworn God and whether or not it is actually Kaido, as I think that we are supposed to be uh, led to believe at this time. And I really think that it could lead to some cool places, even Void Century reveals. And maybe the ancient weapon Uranus. So another big part of this chapter was Raizo communicating with Kinemon, telling them that they had captured the prison and that they now had 3,500 new men that they needed to outfit with weapons. And uh, Kinemon says, well, that's kind of a tough problem because even though there's a bunch of weapons factories in Wano, they're for export. What I gathered from that is that they're basically a lot of guns and not the weapons that the samurai of Wano would actually use, spears and swords. So they wonder where they're going to find 3,500 spears or swords. This seems pretty well telegraphed, in my opinion. Or at least, you know, this will be part of the way in which they solve this problem. Yuki Maro is a weapons collector. He literally has spent however many years stealing weapons from passerbys. And Yuki Maro is actually a character from a... a, a uh, Japanese lore story in which he basically did the exact same thing and then we actually have an actual weapons count he collected 1,000 weapons so yeah guys this seems pretty well telegraphed to me Gyukimaru uh, after he gets recruited is going to give the Alliance a bunch of weapons whether it's all 3,500 I'm not certain but it will be a large number but talking about something that is a little less straightforward I found Kawamatsu to be very interesting in this chapter, guys. I think this is pretty easy to forget because of the break in between, but if you remember the last time that we saw Kawamatsu, we basically told Raizo uh, that he needed to go search out somebody on his own. And so that leads us into the present chapter, and, and we speculated at the time, or I speculated at the time, well, he had a former connection with Hiyori uh, Komurasaki, maybe he is looking for her. And in this chapter, it just the dots align, and now here's Kawamatsu, and he has found Hiyori. Uh, but I think that this could be uh, misleading. I think that Oda might be purposely deceiving us here because it did not appear to me as though a Kawamatsu expected to find her here. It did not appear to me as though he was looking for her. I was waiting for a line like, ah, alas, I have found you. But we never got anything like that. And in fact, uh, Yori basically explains that the last time that she saw him, she ran away from him. And apparently Kawamatsu never even knew why Hiyori abandoned him in the first place. So it just doesn't seem realistic to me for Kawamatsu to have, uh, you know, finally escaped prison. And then his first objective is to search out for Hiyori, uh, who abandoned him and who he wouldn't even know or wouldn't even recognize. And if I'm completely honest, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that Kawamatsu was actually angry with Hiyori for uh, leaving him all those years ago. I mean, you know, he has this look on his face like, oh, it was a good reason uh, why you left me. It was a pure reason, but it sort of can lend towards the interpretation that, that he considered that it may not have been, you know, something so innocent. Or that her departure in some way bothered him and may very well have led to his capture. But anyway, the reason that I'm saying all of this is that I think that uh, I assumed and, and most everybody assumed that Kawamatsu was on this journey to, to find Hiyori. But from this lens, with him being so surprised and didn't even recognize her, I'm more of the opinion. It didn't even say like, oh, I was looking for you. That he was looking for somebody else. That his intention after leaving the prison was to visit with somebody else. And that is really, really interesting to me. Who could it be? Who exactly is out there in the winter wastelands of Ringo? And I also wonder whether this might be related to the connection Oda established in this chapter between Gyukimaro the monk uh, and Kaomatsu. But let's just talk for a moment about Hiyori Komurasaki, guys. You know, maybe it's just just the PTSD uh, from from the Whole Cake Island arc and Pudding, but it just seems the same to me. The way that, that Hiyori overacts as she's crying to Kaomatsu, it does not feel genuine. I don't know if Oda is just trying to like play with me here. It's like, haha, but it's actually the truth. Uh, you know, I don't know, but it just, it just feels not genuine and could imply a uh, more, you know, like uh, an evil nature to Hiyori Komurasaki, or at least something, something off. Let me know if you feel the same way. I know all the facts align, she's Hiyori, she's going to be good, but just, I'm just, uh, I'm not sold by that completely yet. And again, guys, I'm still wondering about her connection with Kyoshiro, and, uh, you know, whether or not she may be more loyal to him than she is her own brother and all the vassals. And just another thing to throw out there, I don't know how this would be possible, but I do believe, given Oda, it is possible. I found it really odd that, that Kawamatsu didn't recognize her. I mean, obviously it's been, what, 13 years, she's a woman now, but even still, you should, you should be able to recognize someone. She's like, Kawamatsu, is that it? And his immediate reaction is like, who the hell are you? Is that some trademark patented low-key Oda foreshadowing? 
We talked earlier about there being a connection between the powers of Momonosuke and Tama, both of them being related to the Peach Boy Momotaro, two halves of the same whole, and a theory very early on in Wano was that Tama was actually Hiyori, um, and, you know, again, we don't, like, she's obviously not aged, and that in and of itself would be a question uh, that we would need to explore in order to understand all of this, but it's just like, I'm wondering, you know, whether or not Komurasaki is the real Hiyori or not, whether that's a role that she's playing, or, you know, is there is there something funky going on here? This is, like, impossible. Impossible to explain to a degree in which everybody would be satisfied, but it is a feeling that I have that I want to share. It seems worthy of contemplation. But yeah, aside from these speculative points of discussion, I honestly felt like this chapter was just like updates. They felt like updates. It didn't feel, I, I would say, I wouldn't, this wasn't the most entertaining chapter of One Piece I ever read. It's like, okay, updates, we have the blueprints. Now they were, you know, uh, Shu Tomorrow was the one to steal them. Update, the prison is now free. Update, Big Mom and Kaido are fighting, presumably, possibly, probably, uh, through the night. Side note, I thought that, that was really underwhelming part of the chapter. Update, all the other Yakuza are finally revealed. So ultimately, I felt like the strong points of this chapter are parts that I really gravitated towards and found the most interesting uh, or, or entertaining uh, was pretty much every part with Kamatsu, Gukimaru, Hiyori, and Zoro, uh, and Queen. Queen is hilarious. Also, I guess two other things that I want to briefly mention before we end this video. It seems likely now, because Oda has brought it up, Kawamatsu seems likely to be a fishman, or at least that was Zoro's initial interpretation. I will find, if that's true, I think that that's interesting either way. I, I also kind of want him to be an actual Kappa, but really it's cool either way to find actual fishmen living in Wano and submits their connection with the Void Sentry and the connection between all of these various people that are sort of housing Poneglyphs. And I'm also interested in Caribou. Caribou specifically is like, like now you guys owe me a favor. I'm really curious where the Caribou plotline goes. And I'm just waiting for their temporary alliance with Caribou to backfire and for him to in some way stab them in the back. If they were smart, they would put Caribou back in that barrel and then set him out to sea. But then again, maybe he takes a Caesar role for this arc and doesn't actually end up being a detriment to the plan. I guess we will find out. But yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say about this chapter. As always, I'm curious as to what you guys think. Share your thoughts in the comment section below. Like the video if you liked the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video. Make sure to subscribe if you want to be notified for my future content. And as always, guys, have a wonderful day.